A lot of Christians were indisputably great contributors scientifically in the past. And Absolutely. I th- so I think even historically, it hasn't always been this antithetical, contentious relationship that people perceive them as today. Even beyond that, I mean, some of the greatest thinkers, Newton was a devout Christian. Uh, he put my discipline on the map. I mean, he's considered the father of, of, of physics. Uh, you've got uh, numerous people, Georges Lemaitre, the guy who came up with the Big Bang idea, the Belgian priest. It is inescapable that many devout Christians were involved, especially early on in the scientific. And you can make a strong argument that the scientific enterprise grew out of a Judeo-Christian worldview. What's indisputable is there have been many devout, strong Christians that throughout the history of the scientific enterprise, you know, the last four or 500 years, Christians have been actively involved in that and made great contributions. So there's no sense where science is hostile to people who want to explore God's creation. And that goes back to your opening response where our faith isn't entirely blind per se, right? There is still mm-hmm. basis within that faith. Uh, I think the best definition of faith I've heard from a Christian philosopher I've had in the podcast before is your willingness to believe in the intangible based on certain tangible aspects of that. And mm-hmm. at least with my faith, like there is evidence in my own life, anecdotal or not, in addition to this leap that I'm willing to take. Uh, and of course, you have more, I guess, robust foundation because per your missions, you believe that the foundational knowledge in biblical truth aligns well with your scientific background. One of the things that I found in my scientific studies is that the way I see Christians have approached studying scripture very much aligns with the way I see them studying creation. Among those things, one is that you don't just get to say, here's my idea, it's truth. It's like, okay, here's my idea. How do I evaluate whether it's true? I mean, Paul even talking to various people said, you know, hey, the Bereans, they did just didn't take my word for this. I mean, if if Christianity was based on the authority of what somebody said, then Paul would just say, hey, here's the truth, believe it. Well, no, they were going out and checking what he said against the scriptures, and he was lauding them for saying, hey, you didn't just take my word. You actually made sure what I was saying aligned with what scripture said. Well, I mean, that's what we do when we go out and do science. It's not Einstein doesn't come up and say, well, this is the way it works. He said, well, here's my idea. How do you go test it? Can we be confident of the idea, not of the person saying it? Now, you can't get around as you've established your credibility in showing the truth of things. Yes, I do put a little bit more credence in Einstein having an insight than maybe myself having an insight just because of how good he was at doing it. But at the end of the day, science is determined by what the world says is true, not by how prominent you are, how widespread the idea is, anything like that. It's like, does it align with reality? And there's a lot of things that we kind of take by faith same kind of Christian faith, confident trust in a reliable source that we take by faith in our scientific studies. So I think you're alluding to like scientism, right? It's almost like replacing the Bible on the altar with this idea that whatever scientific finding I believe in, that's an absolute truth. Because the scientism with a capital S is it's infallible, whatever I believe, it stays that way, Mm -hmm. which is equally dangerous as any other, I think, non-evidence-based belief, so to speak. To me, the the big problem with scientism is that this is the only way to believe, and once we found this here, then it's inviolable. I think that's a problem, and I do think that contributes to some of this perceived gap between science and Christianity. But there's also aspects just in the operation of, I mean, any any physicist worth their salt goes out thinking that the laws of physics as we measured them yesterday are going to apply today, tomorrow, and in the future. We have a set of evidence that shows that, yes, that's a trustworthy thing to believe, but there's nothing that says it's got to be that way. We're taking that on faith. We're confident that because of what we've seen that the laws of physics will behave tomorrow, but there's nothing that specifies that has to be that way unless God has created the world because then God, you know, again, bringing my theological thoughts on that, 
in Christianity, the world doesn't exist because it just does. It exists because God created the world. He intimately and moment by moment holds it together. If he were to withdraw his hands, it would tumble into non-existence. So why would I expect it to be so reliable and trustworthy? Well, because God is immutable and unchangeable and reliable and trustworthy. I would expect his creation to behave similarly. So I have a good theological reason to align with my empirical data that says, yes, the laws of physics are trustworthy and reliable. But if you take away the theological reason, there's no reason to think that the laws of physics might not just change tomorrow. Now, we have an abundance of evidence that seem to indicate, but there's lots of times where this isn't going to happen, and then, lo, something catastrophic happens the next day. That's what happens with earthquakes and tornadoes and floods. We operate like, well, the evidence says, hey, this is, this is an okay place to build. Nothing happens until that 500-year flood happens. Why couldn't that happen with the laws of physics? Well, theologically, I know why it wouldn't happen, but it's not clear to me why the naturalist would say it wouldn't happen. There is a couple of directions, but since you reference Einstein, obviously the father <laughs> of physics, but many times. So you talked about constant law of physics, right? In one of your talks, you talked about laws of physics don't depend on locations or motion. Mm -hmm. So why do the laws of physics change throughout the universe? Actually, I don't think they do. Oh, okay. And, and that is part of that. And that's a philosophical idea. I mean, again, it's a, sorry, it's well-reasoned depending on your worldview. If Greek mythology was the right way to look at things, then I don't think there's any reason to think the laws of physics shouldn't change throughout the world because you've got Zeus being angry some days and Poseidon <laughs> controls the seas and they're capricious personalities driving how the world works. And so there's no reason to think the laws of physics ought to be the same. But one of the things that, and then this is a little bit of a subtle technical point, but relevant to the question you made, is that when physicists in the early 1900s, late 1800s, were looking at electromagnetism and motion, like Newtonian motion, electromagnetism, what they realized is that in certain instances, the way things would behave according to Newton's laws of motion was different than the way things would behave according to our understanding of electromagnetism. And, and this is the, you know, one of the great thought experiments. So you know, I know that when I'm driving down the road or I'm on a train and I throw a ball, somebody outside the train will see the ball moving at the velocity of the train plus the velocity with which I threw it. Makes great sense, right? Except when you go into electromagnetism, light always moves at the speed of light. So you've got this train moving along. I turn a flashlight on. Does the light now move at the speed of light or does it move at the speed of light plus the speed of the train? This may sound a weird way to say that, but what Einstein recognized is that the way we de had developed those two theories, the laws of physics looked different depending on how you were moving. Mm. And that was the philosophical germ of the idea that said, he said, or he basically said, and this is Jeff Zwerink's paraphrase of what happened there, is we can tell where we are based on how we're moving. The laws of physics shouldn't be that way. What would it take to develop a set of physical laws that don't depend on motion or location? And it was that idea that led to the theory of special relativity, which accounts for constant velocity motion, and then general relativity, which is accelerations. And I can tell you this, every experimental test we've thrown at general relativity, it's passed with flying colors. And it explained some things that Newtonian dynamics couldn't because it was, Newtonian dynamics is just a smaller approximation. In the realm where you're dealing in low velocities and small gravitational masses, relativity reduces down to Newtonian dynamics. But general relativity gives us a more complete explanation of the universe. And one of the things that flows out of that is it codified in general relativity is the idea that the laws of physics don't change depending on motion or location or time in the universe, which I think is a very, it's a philosophical idea, but a very Christian idea. Man, that's fascinating. The And also, I want to go back to when you said the universe is dynamic, which it is, right? That's been proven. Right. Reminds me of in the Bible when the Genesis, when God said, let there be light and let there be life, right? The way he created life. Mm -hmm. 
Because as you know, life is also very dynamic. Mm-hmm. It's an emerging phenomenon, right? You're going from a single cellular cell of a virus of this, like the lower differential energy, so to speak, to a higher level. Okay. And we're becoming more and more complex, more infinitely complex and nuanced. So in that sense, I feel like it's also very congruent with the way God describes how he created life and let there be light and the way he created life in his image because God's also very dynamic. And I think that also to me, based on this conversation so far, it aligns with, yeah, universe itself, the known universe is also dynamic. Mm. So is this life within this container of universe is also dynamic. So I, I sense some congruence there. So help me as a physicist because or oh, God. I, I'm just sitting here trying to, I, so you're saying, okay, so there's this dynamic nature to the material stuff of the universe, the space, the time is a flexible mm-hmm. dynamic quantity. Yes, I do see that life has changed dramatically over time. Mm-hmm. In my physics mind, that doesn't that doesn't translate to dynamic. Can I, I'm just trying to understand what you're saying there to interact with. Yeah, it. I mean, you scare me when you say "help me" as a physicist. <laughs> I was like, "Oh Lord, <laughs> God, Jesus, take the wheel." So what I mean by that is, even if you think about like a human form, right? Okay, because. Like, like people say we're the highest level of intelligence or body with a consciousness. Of course, consciousness is another entire different game with quantum mechanics and so on. But even the way we interact, because it's a constant interplay. Mm-hmm. Like my consciousness, my knowledge, our conversations, it's bi-directional. It contributes, like your knowledge mm-hmm. contributes to my knowledge and vice versa, right. hopefully. And in that sense, if you iterate that over time, what we embody is also the, the byproduct of the interplay which is also very dynamic based on each other's exchange. And and I think if you like extrapolate that over time, that's the dynamicness I'm thinking about where we're not really, we're not really fixed. Like our thoughts that we talked about where our thoughts are not a reality per se, but our thoughts also shift and change and expand over time. The immediate thought that came to mind in the discussion is like, okay, so there's the aspect of the universe. the, The universe is what it is, if you will. But in the aspect of being a universe, there's a dynamic nature to it, specifically that it can expand in, in this case. But as humans go, there's a Jeff Zwerink or a personness about who I am, but there's also this dynamic interaction with the physical and at other people that I'm Jeff Zwerink, but I'm also growing, maturing, stretching, and dy- so that's the connection you're making yep. there. I think that's an interesting connection. So Yeah, and even as children, right? Because like when you're a kid, as we talked about your father, mm-hmm. right, with kids, like when we're kids, we perceive our parents as gods, like our right. idiosyncrasies, whatever they say, the society, the religion, the church, the school, we internalized these instilled beliefs mm-hmm. and we all pull them as truth until we replace that truth with additional knowledge or additional exchange with other people. Right. And eventually we mature and blossom into independent adulthood where we uphold our own truth. Right. So I think even in that sense, if you look at the psychologically, the stages of development and developmental changes, Mm -hmm. I think it still is congruent with this dynamic where everything, at least within our known universe, especially on Earth, is a constant exchange and constant dynamic relationship with one another. That is very much the case. 